Well, good morning. Uh, good morning for me. Good afternoon for those of you in the East Coast. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to this third uh, webinar on transformative practices for group processing in spiritual communities. Uh, my name is Tania Marquez, and I am a Unitarian Universalist hospital chaplain here in California. And I'm also a um, member uh, of this project uh, through Boston Universities as well. Um, so I just want to make a couple of reminders for those of you who are attending this uh, webinar. If you want to ask a question, the best way to do that is through the Q&A section. So you make sure that you click that and you put your questions there. The chat is also open. So if you want to interact with, uh, you know, make comments and chat during the presentation, you are welcome to do that. But I do ask that if you have questions that you place them in the Q&A, it's easier for us to keep track of the questions in the Q&A than it is to keep track of them in the chat. So that would be wonderful, but both of those uh, tools are available for you to use uh, throughout this webinar. <clears throat> so we um, decided to host this webinar around group processing and facilitating groups. When trauma is in the room, uh, we want to highlight some of the practices that you know people are doing well. So we put together three webinars, and this is the last of the three, on the transformative practices for group processing in spiritual communities. This webinar, as you know, is hosted by the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab, and it is also funded by the Lilly Endowment. So you can check out the archive webinars on the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab website for the first uh, of the two series. And today I am just so thrilled and so excited to be in this conversation with Indira Udofia. Indira, welcome to this space. And let me just tell you a little bit about Indira. Uh, Indira is a PhD student in social work at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, North Carolina a and University. And they provide community and clinical care through a wide range of practice, practices, including therapeutic and spiritual services, clinical and academic research, writing and collaborative projects. Her extensive work experiences in clinical and community settings since 2009 and faith communities since 2014 shaped her deep wisdom for helping communities and individuals recover from trauma, especially in spaces of spiritual abuse and grief. Indira believes that her work is a collaborative effort to empower others in their own lives and healing journey. We are so pleased to have Indira here with us today. And with that, Indira, the floor is yours. Welcome. And thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you for uh, such a warm welcome. Um, hello, I bring you greetings. Um, and as reflective of my Baptist uh, background from Greensboro, North Carolina, where I'm currently located with my loving cat who you may hear in the background. So sorry in advance if that happens. Um, and I am excited uh, to share space with you all um, who are part of the Chaplain's Innovation Lab and the Trauma Responsive uh, uh, Congregations Project and BU, uh, which has a warm place in my heart. A special thank you to Dr. Rambo and Yulise um, and the whole team for inviting me to share space with you all today. Um, and so our conversation, um, which I'm really excited about, having dialogue. So please, as things are popping up, please put them in chats and in the Q&A section because I am, I, I want to dialogue, um, is talking about how do we sit with our stories um, and resisting the need for absolution um, and embracing the art of confession and group processing. Um, as my bio kind of names, I have a lot of experience being both a licensed clinical social worker, um, licensed in the state of Virginia and North Carolina, as well as being seminary trained um, and going to the illustrious BU uh, for trauma studies and queer, uh, queer uh, stuff around spiritual trauma as my academic training. Um, and I'm currently working on looking at the impacts of religious violence and spiritual trauma on African-American millennials and Gen Zs. Um, and so I have a lot of experience 
holding space in the room, balancing between being either a therapist or a spiritual leader or just someone who is co-journeying with people through group facilitation. I mean, I'm hoping that the things that I'm sharing today are ways that you can enhance your experience and build your toolkit, as well as answer some of the anxiety that comes up with your positionality as a spiritual leader in group processing. So our agenda is a pretty, a pretty fluid one that's normally in style with how I tend to engage trainings in general. Um, we will have an opening practice, which I know um, is not something that is traditional in academic sense, but is very part of how you do group processing work. Um, normally it's an icebreaker or it's something, but we are gonna do some type of grounding exercise together. Um, and it'll only be 30 seconds because I'm just gonna model what that might feel like and look like in the moment for you to then do it. And I'll give you some tips and tricks on how to employ it in a group setting. Then we'll just talk about understanding our roles as facilitators versus a spiritual leader or pastor. Um, what are some of the things that you have to hold into balance as you are um, holding space in the room as a facilitator? Um, and then how do you manage your anxieties for meaning making or resolution, right? Um, like I said, I come from charismatic backgrounds. So, you know, pastors love to sneak a preach or get a sermon in. Um, and so how do we manage that impulse, right, to resolve or to create meaning in the room? You know, what does it mean about us as facilitators to hold space for the process to just have to be the process, right? And then we'll talk a little bit about two ways that you can navigate traumatic um, re-experiencing or activation um, in a room space. Um, things that are helpful uh, as grounding exercises, as practices um, for collective closure after a session that, I, that are adaptable for various types of contexts um, that are not required to uh, be a, you don't have to be a licensed, trained mental health professional to be able to do um, in the moment to be able to hold space for people who may be either activated or just knowing that you need to be able to transition or, or transition out of a group session or transition from one story to the next. And then obviously comments and questions, which I am very, that's the part that I'm most excited about. So I am going to employ with my Southern colleagues call my New York tongues. So I may talk a little fast. So please feel free to ask me to circle back to a point um, at any point of the thing. And I'll make sure during the q and I recapture something that you may not have understood. So the first thing we're gonna do is open practice. Um, and I am going to um, do a spiritual practice called breath prayer. Um, this is something that has been known um, by folks who do spiritual work as well as folks who engage in mental health about how to do intentional affirmations and breath. Um, and so a simple way that we do this, right, is inviting the people in the room to be either close their eyes if they're comfortable or set your gaze softly um, and then engaging them to do a deep breath using a mantra as a way to symbolize taking a deep breath, holding your breath and releasing. And so it may work where I might invite you to just take a deep breath. Um, sit comfortably, you know, relax your shoulders, sit with your feet, um, feet shoulder width apart, you know, relax as you are able, and then invite you to inhale, and then hold that may the God, wounded God, hold our wounds in this space, and then release. And you may do that a couple of times, right? So you may inhale again, knowing that there is a God who holds wounds, and asking and, and inviting the God that holds the wound to hold the wounds and the traumas and the stories that we experience in the space and then offering it as a release. So you may do that five times, 10 times during the practice, but what it does is it allows you one to get the initial nerves out of your body um, that might be percolating as people are coming into a space. It allows you to start 
the grounding, right, to start modeling what grounding might look like. It also invites the room to do grounding work with you, right? Because at the end of the day, as we're going to talk about, this process of group facilitation is a process of co-journeying with a group of people um, as you all are holding space for people's stories. So just some nitty gritty one-on-one group group facilitation one-on-one that I think is important to note, right, is that facilitation has three purposes. It's supposed to help, a, as a facilitator, you're just helping people move through a process together. You are not the seat of wisdom, right? So you're not there to offer solutions or give out your opinions or offer judgment. You are there to draw and facilitate the environment of people creating to develop these ideas, opinions, beliefs, patterns on their own, right? And facilitation focuses on how you participate in this process of either planning or learning. And it's not about the outcome, right? Which is everyone share their stories or, you know, planning whatever project that you have in place, but it's about the work of getting there, right? It's the journey, so to speak. And so facilitate as a facilitator, your goal is to get people involved in the process as they begin to go cultivate the tools that are necessary to move from point A to point B, whatever that point B might look like for them. And as a facilitator, you are supposed to inhibit some neutrality and not take sides, right? And I put these in air quotes because we are not uninvolved people, but I think it's important for us to, to be able to check ourselves in the moment and ask what's at stake for me if I'm supposed to draw some type of opinion about what is being shared or if I issue judgment, right? And checking with our internal biases and our internal narratives, right? That cause that draws us and sometimes prick us in the moment to be able to regulate those things for ourselves and do that work outside of the space of the group processing. So there are gonna be times where things are being shared or things are gonna come up in the heat of the moment that are gonna activate you. And so the world, the goal of that work of group facilitation is to be able to manage your own somatic experience enough so that you can actually take some time to go and hit your prayer closet or your journal or your therapist <laughs> to be able to talk, work through what might be pricked, but not being able, not giving that burden of your own personal response to the person who's actively sharing in a vulnerable space. And so what does holding space and group processing look like as a facilitator versus a pastor or a practitioner, right? And the major thing that it that is at stake is learning how to subvert power in the room. Again, I am speaking about my positionality, working with folks who are part of the um, historic Black church institution. Um, I'm working with folks who are coming from predominantly charismatic backgrounds. Um, and so if whether or not you're a deacon or an elder or a pastor or just someone who people have um, deemed spiritual authority, group processing requires the subversion and the democratization of power. And so one of the ways that we do this, right, is through group agreements. And I think in um, the first uh, webinar, they talked a lot about what are some of the collective agreements. Collective agreement allows for the process of a collective imagination of what the space can be, whether that space is predicated on building safety or building bravery um, or building um, room for generative growth and healing. There is agreement that the group must come together. Now, I'm not saying you go into a room and set up the room and have nothing in your back pocket, right? Because there are going to be people who are not able to initially articulate things that they, they need for a room in order for them to feel comfortable with exhibiting bravery and vulnerability, right? Um, which is the framework that I try to use rather than using stuff like safe spaces, because for certain marginalized bodies, we don't know what safety looks like. And so it's not realistic to say that honestly safety is something that happens in such a violent world, but we can honor bravery in the vulnerability of sharing with one another. 
Um, and so that's one of the things that we get we do right is like thinking about what do group agreements look like and collective imagination. Another thing that happens as a facilitator, right, is that you're building rapport as a co-journeyer rather than having this emotional distance as leader. What do I mean? I do not mean in the moment that you're going to share your story from your woundedness, sobbing and crying, right, where the group has to um, jump in to save you, right, in the moment. But it does mean engaging in the practices with the level of openness for you to also have the ability to be transformed in the sharing of stories, meaning that you are modeling the type of listening, the type of engagement that you want others to see, right? That you are engaging in things like icebreakers to break up the ice, right? That you are sharing and checking in around your day with a semblance of appropriate honesty, right? If it's been a chaotic week, if you're doing a, you know, what is the week, you know, how has your week gone as an as a opening or an icebreaker for the group? You know, your response can't be blessed and highly favored every single week because that's just not realistic, right? Um, but being able to show and model a level of openness as a co-journeyer because you are engaging in the process as you are hearing and holding space for stories as well. The other thing around subverting power is learning how to embrace vulnerability by not having the answers, right? Um, how that how that shows up or what that looks like is being able to not have a resolution to certain stories when questions arise. Um, as a therapist, right, I am constantly charged with sitting with people as they will question, well, like, I don't know why this person wronged me, or I don't know why God would allow this thing to happen, right? And the truth of the matter is, is that the there's a vulnerability in saying, while I may not have the answer, right, I'm here to hold space to know that you can wrestle in this moment. And that vulnerability of not holding the answer does not force me to come up with a platitude, right, to placate a feeling, but allows the process in the room for imagination to work um, in real time. So holding space, right, shows up as being able to, to rest in a question and not offer a solution or an answer in that moment, knowing that that's a power, right, that, that pastors tend to be look to for answers, right? And part of group facilitation is leaving those things open-ended so that the continued work and sharing of the story can bring the revelation to come. And then finally, um, community care as aftercare, right? So one of the major things that I think is important when we think about um, subverting power in the room is that often there's an expectation for certain spiritual leaders that they are the arbiters of care, right? That they're they're the people that you follow up and call, right? You're the ones you're going to be praying for them. You're going to check in on them and the, throughout the week, you're going to touch base with them and do that. And while in smaller focus, that might be something that's realistic, I it's not realistic for all communities. So empowering the community through community cares, right? Identifying people that are naturally building maybe a relationship or a rapport to be able to touch base with one another, right? To check in on one another. Um, this model is something that is indicative of a lot of, you know, self or peer support groups, right? We see this in like um, the AA, the Alcoholics Narcotics Anonymous groups, right? Where people may have sponsors or people may have um, families of groups of people who are kind of all underneath the toolages of a mentor. They all are connecting together and making sure that they're touching base and providing care. Um, you know, folks who have prayer partners, it's the same type of premise. So thinking about what are, what are the ways that you can encourage the group itself to be able to be responsible for the care of the group, right? Um, whether that's, you know, after every session, right? 
taking a bowl of names of people who are in attendance, everyone drawing a name, and that person is the person that you're praying, you know, you're touching base with, and you're following up with um, doing it. Now, there are ways to circumvent that so that you're not, you know, having people being licensed professional therapists, you know, on their off time. Um, and their and that goes back to the agreements that you said in the beginning, right, which is like, you know, part of community care is that, you know, I am going to just lift up your name in my meditation time or in prayer once a week. I'm going to, you know, um, if you need me, shoot me a text. You know, we can maybe meet up for lunch just to hold space and just see how you're doing. Um, and that way, the group is responsible for making sure that the group has aftercare, right? Um, also, the way that works is like people being in charge of the closing ritual each week, passing that off to different participants, right, of things that bring them solace, things that bring them back to themselves after um, experiencing hardship or challenge and sharing those resources in the group. So we know that the responsibility as a group facilitation leader is you're basically in charge of setting up in the logistics, right? Where is this space being held? Um, what does the room look like? How are the seats being handled? What are some things that you need? Um, things that I find that are really helpful when we're thinking about um, group facilitation is thinking about things like, you know, what are some things that can be used that are tactile, right? To help people as they're, you know, experiencing and make the room safe. Is it having some essential oils in a corner? Is it having a coloring book or fidget station for folks who may feel a little antsy and need to kind of move stuff out of their body? Is it having blankets um, for folks who, you know, need something warm and cozy or chill? What are some things that I can do to facilitate a semblance of comfort, right? in the environmental space as people are having this experience, right? Um, holding people accountable to agree agreements, right? So if sharing time is three to five minutes and, you know, folks, a person is up there and they're nearing six or seven, right? Your job as a facility is to point them back, right? To the agreements that we were only going to share for three to five. So, you know, maybe thinking about how do we bring this story to a close or right? Or what's the major point or takeaway you want to share with us before we move on to the next um, person for sharing, right? Um, also monitoring a uh, room's energy, right? Through body language or nonverbal cues. Um, I, in one of my many, many roles, right? Um, as a therapist and a spiritual goat is I actually work with clergy peer support groups um, on navigating burnout. Um, and I remember specifically there was an instance where someone was sharing a very uh, powerful story about their experience in ministry um, that had a lot of trauma. Um, and as the person was sharing, you know, I notice people's bodies, right, in the room just starting to shift, right, and you can tell that the energy was moving into a way that was, you know, that required it, so before we jumped into the next story, right, we actually took a moment, right, to be like, you know, to one, offer gratitude for the sharing of the story, and then offer movement, right, so for people to kind of stretch, right, to take the stand up, to move around, to stretch a little bit, right? Engaging in that breath prayer practice that we engaged in and then going back into the space, right? Because we, I knew that the story had taken up so much room in that space that we needed ways to kind of attune and shift so we can kind of get back to a, a, a open shared space. Um, and then finally, Facilitating rapport and um, cultivating peer investment in the group, right? These are th through things like icebreakers, right? Inviting people to take ownership of certain aspects of the experience, right? So, you know, does someone want to bring in donuts, um, gluten-free donuts because it's their birthday? Like, or does someone have a really cool icebreaker that they would like to, you know, what's a fun icebreaker that they've engaged that they would like to, you know, lead off with or what is a closing practice um, that they would like to invite people into rather that's like oh I'd like to share this song that I heard or do things like that cultivating that group thing also does that type of way of again you're still facilitating the group but you're allowing the group to take ownership and subvert some of the power that's in the room 
So um, how do we manage our anxieties for resolution and meaning making? Um, you know, one is learning how to sit right with these uncomfortable questions that come up, right? When trauma is in the room, um, you know, what do we do? How do we do it? Like, how can I make things better? Can I make things better? Um, and the one thing I have to ask you is, you know, is to remind you, right? That your work is to hold the space for spirit to do work, right? And so part of that is while we can give strategies and tools, right, for grounding and connecting with self and we can do things to do harm, it is not up to us to come up with the, with the big A answers all the time. Um, and it is okay with not being okay. That's part of the reason why you are a co-journeyer and not a leader in that space, right? Um, and so being uncomfortable is like checking in with the body. Um, and so one of the modalities that I'm trained in as a therapist is called brain spotting, who is invented by David Brand. Um, and one of the major mantras that we talk about is how do we stay in the tail of the comet, right? If we think that by storytelling, right, we are long launching a comet. A comet is going into launch, right? It is setting the trajectory to be able to land, to, to explode, to be whatever it needs to be, right? Whether that, that trajectory leads to the birth of something new or the removal of something that's not harmful, right? Staying in the tail of the comet means following the lead of the person who's engaged in the storytelling exercise, right? And following their lead as they are setting the trajectory towards their own healing. So my job is to not necessarily drive the seat of what healing looks like through my own definition, through my own stories, through my own meaning making structures. But as someone is going through that process, right? How do I stay in the flow with them, stay attuned to them in that moment so that they can get to the end goal of their healing journey, right? Through the sharing of their story in their space. The other thing is learning how to embrace being seen and seeing others, right? As leaders, we can be very open to perceiving others, right? It is very easy to see people. It is a lot harder for us to be seen. And I think holding space for this idea of the diffusion of power through group processing, right? Allows us to kind of be seen. So it means that we get to have off days, right? It gets to mean, it means that sometimes we have to name in a group if we realize in a group process that we fell short, being able to name those faults, right? And allow for room for imperfection to exist and to occur, right? It means that like, it is a way for sometimes being called in by the group and also having the group call us, call the group calling us in, as well as us being able to call in certain members of the group when we fall short and having a dialogue and not being punitive, but being imaginative about how repair can look like and being open to what repair looks like. And then finally, just remembering that the gift of presence is enough. I think, you know, if you are seminary trained, um, like I am, you know, we talk about the gift of presence, but we don't actually know, um, we don't actually take it as seriously as we should, that sometimes just bearing witness to the art of confession, just bearing witness to someone sharing the thing that is on their heart and their soul is enough. We don't need to hear or get platitudes or, you know, we don't need to offer anything that sometimes it's just being able to let it out so that the affirmation can come from the internal compasses and the, and the, and the somatic knowing of their own truth. And sometimes we just need to sit there and bear witness to that rather than trying to sermonize or figure out how you can wrap this up in a neat bow. That sometimes the work of being undone is precisely the, the work that needs to be done. And sometimes we just need people to bear witness to that. Okay, so, um, I went too fast, I went too far, there we go. So how do we navigate activation, right? So like there are times where we are sharing um, and the room gets high, right? And, you know, there's there's energy, right? There's it, there's my own discomfort or the discomfort in other people. So how do you manage that in the moment in real time, right? Um, and so there's two 
ways that we can do that, right? The one way is through ritual, right? Through things like breath prayer, through things like meditation, through things like having, you know, echoing a mantra, right? Um, the things that we practice at the beginning, lighting a candle, um, inviting people to write things down to get it out of their body mind um, and writing it on paper and doing something with that paper, whether that's, you know, melting it in a, bo a bowl of water so that all the ink diffuses and it's just a muddy thing and then you pour it clean or, you know, my favorite thing is always going to be taking a candle taking a fireproof bowl or a cauldron if that's your if that's your jam and lighting that sucker on fire and releasing it to the ethos right the other thing that you can do right is this other practice which is a more somatic based approach right which is called resource spotting um this comes from um the training work that i did with david grand um where um you are and this is something that you as just a regular lay person a non-practitioner can do um, and so what it looks like is how you look and where you look impacts how you feel. And so some of the ways that you can kind of regulate someone's emotional response is being able to call people's attention to connect with their bodies and let their bodies, right, give you a resource space that folks can focus their attention on to either deactivate their body or activate it, right? And so resource pausing is all about deactivation. So I normally invite people to, you know, either, you know, soften their gaze or um, close their eyes if that's more comfortable for them. And I'll ask them to find a spot in their body that feels neutral, right? Um, for some people, they may know when they're at upset because of their stomach or their head, or you know they get this like tightness or heat in their shoulders, right? And so I'll ask them not to focus on the parts that are are screaming loud, but what is the thing that does not feel like anything at all, right? Um, this can range from the bottom of your foot to your elbow. Um, someone <laughs> once said that their pinky nail was really just neutral, right? And I will ask them as they're intentionally focusing on their breath to just focus on their pinky nail for a moment, right? Like, and then see what part of the room makes you feel the most connected to your pinky nail. Now, some people will look up, some people will be looking at you, some people will be looking down, some people will look past you. And wherever that spot is, wherever they're situating, right? I want them to fixate on that spot and focus on their pinky nail and invite them to see if they can take that resource spot of the pinky nail and see if they can take it through the pinky, right? And doing what we call a body scan to be able to see if they can spread that neutrality from that one located spot on their body to a larger part of their body. This is an exercise that can take two minutes, right? Or a minute is just like learning how to connect. And what you will find is that people are fixating on that particular point and their particular resource spot, people's body language starts to change, their shoulders drop, their breath becomes more at ease, right? You know, some folks might start rocking. Some folks may get tearful and start kind of wiping away tears so that they can release whatever pent up emotions in the body. Whatever that looks like for them, giving them space to kind of come and cool down. And then after a certain moment of time, just checking back in and being like, you know, on a scale of like one to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever felt, one being the worst, how do you feel? And people may say like, I feel like I'm like a four, right? And we can say we can work with four. Um, and then once we get a communal agreement that we're at a place where most of the people's bodies are less activated, then moving on to the next thing. Um, what we find by doing things like resource spottings or even engaging in certain practices or rituals is that by giving people ways to externalize this psychosomatic experiencing that's happening in the body when we are either hearing stories of trauma, um, reciting our own stories of trauma, or just being in a traumatic space, right? Is that by getting it out the body, right? And being able to connect with other types of movement or practices, we're not holding that in the space. And so therefore, when we either return to this task or we engage into a new task, we already disarmed ourselves enough 
so that we're not activating, working from an activated trigger point. And so, you know, these are just some things, right, that I think are really kind of helpful as we're doing, as we're thinking about group facilitation, right? How do we connect with the body-mind phenomenon, right? How do we connect with this psychosomatic pairing in the moment, right? What are some things that get kicked up in the work that we do because we're passionate and we care and we want to love on people? Um, but how do we do that in a way um, that doesn't cause us to experience a certain level of compassion fatigue because we're not tending to our needs. So I am going to now hand it over to Tanya as we go through the Q&As, and I look forward to hearing your feedback and um, engaging in dialogue. Thank you so much. Indira, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. So many resources, so much insight and wisdom that you have shared with us today. And before we jump into the Q&A questions, I just want to let people know that if they want to find you and how they can find you um, in social media, online, and there was also a question about whether the slides were going to be available to people. So I will post that information in the chat. Um, so this is how you can find Indira online if you want to touch base uh, with Indira, uh, just, you know, stay in touch in some ways or in others. Um, there's also the link to Indira's presentation today. And, um, and there's also a survey. Um, you don't need to do this now, but um, if you can complete it at the end of the webinar, it will be also wonderful. And please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A um, session. There's a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A, and that's where you can type in your questions. And it looks like we have a couple. Mm -hmm. um, so this is from Tavadzwa uh, Verima, and my apologies if I mispronounce your name. Um, and she's from Zimbabwe, and it says, I would like to ask as a facilitator, do you allow group agreements that might be potentially be a negative direction to the process of the group while embracing vulnerability to not having all the answers, or do you intervene to redirect the group towards an agreement that is more positive? So I think uh, it's a both and. So one of the things that I, I think there's discernment that happens. So if one of the agreements is we're gonna just combat in the moment, right? I remind them of what the purpose of the group. I think beat one, having a purpose or an aim for why you're meeting helps shape agreements. And I always start with the types of agreements that I think we need to think about before we start, right? So it's not a free for all. So things of like, you know, there's no such thing as silly or asinine questions is a thing that I put as an agreement, right? That we are going to be open to curiosity, that we're gonna be open to listening um, to questions, even if it seems as if those questions are mundane or not, or are not indicative of a, a larger process. Um, there are other folks, right, where they may want to have processes around steamrolling. And then I have to ask whether or not the group desires for that, right? So every agreement we have has to have a group consensus. So if it does not feel good or if they're conflicting agreements, then we have a conversation in the midst of those things around like, what's at stake? by having this thing, right? What are you hoping to aim? What type of space are you looking for when that shows up? And hopefully that weeds out the more, as you have named them, negative type of agreements, but it also gives room for people to kind of own up to maybe the whys behind what they're naming or what they're saying in real time. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Indira. Um, I made so many notes. There was so much that I wanted to just like keep hearing about. And um, again, so much uh, insightful. And I also have another question for you. But I wanted to just come back to the, um, the value of presence uh, mm -hmm. that you pointed out and, and that you're right. You know, many of us who go into seminary or chaplains, uh, we hear this all the time. But I think it's also one of the concepts that just takes a long time to um, 
to fully understand and, and to grasp perhaps. Uh, but I like how you, um, if I'm not mistaken, I hear you say that it's, it's, it's a, sort of a somatic knowing. And I really appreciated that concept. You know, it's a different kind of knowing. It's not, it's not the mind, it's not the intellect, but it's really something of the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, I think, you know, when we talk about somatic work, right. Um, one of the things that I'm really like keen on is talking through like, okay, what do the divine yeses feel like in your body? Mm -hmm. Right. So when you know that something is aligned to the kind of like energy and vibe, what does that look like? And then I'm asking, what does anxiety show up? How does that show up in your body? Right. And what we find is that if we can if we can talk about decision making from a somatic experience, what we what we notice is that the certain kind of impulse to jump in or to fix tends not to be coming from this like divine yes confidence area. It's normally an anxiety, right? It's like this discomfort, like mm, let me just say something, right? And so, how do we slow that down enough, right, to be able to connect with ourselves and trust, right? It's about facilitating trust not only between you and the other party, but spirit, right? That spirit has a space that if you can lean into trust by not moving off the impulses of anxiety, right? That it actually provides a more richer experience of connection. Yeah, I and I love, again, that idea now of the divine yes, you know, how does that divine yes uh, feels in your body? And here's another question. Um, it comes from um, Shelly, and it says, I'm appreciating your insights about following the trail of the comet. Can you say a bit more about what this looks like in a group? Yes. Also, hi, Dr. Rambo. Um, so how this works, right, is like normally when you're in a group session, you know, you have folks who are sharing, you know, you have folks who are kind of like bouncing back off of things. So let's say this is a task based group, right, because there's different time ways that we gather for task based following the tail of the comet means that like sometimes things are going to naturally bounce off of each other. Um, and so letting that kind of group process, so it means that in the moment where there may be some type of like conflictual imagination happening, that means that being able to kind of, being able to follow where the generative and asking certain questions to spark kind of the natural resolution of things. When it comes to trauma work and when you're doing like trauma or therapeutic style groups, right, that means being able to share, right, in the moment, like allowing that person to share and also reading the energy of the room, right? So it means that, you know, some people are going to be fidgety, right? Some people are gonna maybe look uncomfortable and following the tale of the comment is being mindful of how people are experiencing the story in real time, right? What is the generative properties of what's being shared? And then using the, the moments of space and silence or ritual or, you know, deactivation session to be able to allow people to move out. So this is when um, um, environment is really important, right? So for folks who are um, fidgeters um, or internal processors like myself, um, having things that people can either tactile do or being able to have like a room, right? A coloring room, a coloring space, or having a tea bar, right? Where people can kind of go to move their bodies so that they can kind of begin to work out what's happening in real time. And then, you know, following up with that person, you know, maybe if you have, if you're someone who has like peer support embedded in the group, having someone kind of follow base with that person just to sit and provide like a body doubling presence where you're not necessarily saying anything, but you're allowing yourself to kind of allowing that person to have their experience, but know that there's someone that's co-journeying with them in the midst of their experience, right? Um, and then uh, the other piece is thinking about stuff um, around like, you know, when people are activated or people are moving around, like what does ritual look like? So sometimes the activity that you have planned is not gonna be the suitable activity for you to close out with. And so how do, how do you then pivot, right? 
to provide the type of closure you need, whether that's just, you know, departing in silence or using a, a song rather than, you know, doing something that's talkative um, as, a, as a way to do it. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much, Indira. We have a couple of questions more. Uh, the first one is from uh, Donald Miller Mutia. So I'm a chaplain in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who leads spiritual care support groups in neuro neurodiverse contexts of behavioral health. In this context, mental health patients level, skill, capacity, energy vary. Some are very verbal and articulate, while others aren't, which are caused by diverse factors, medication, mental health status, depression, some type of psychosis. In some sessions I lead, there are occasions when the majority of participants are not very uh, verbal or do not talk at all, that energy is very low. How do we, as facilitators, frame providing spiritual support when the participants are not verbal? At a minimum, they will just say their name. How might we imagine care in group support setting when participants are not up for talking or sharing stories because they are neuroatypical or for whatever reason? Yeah, and I think this is when tactile activities are important, right? So engaging in other ways that people can provide feedback or provide space um, for being able to kind of share their experience. So whether that's just a mood chart of just like, you know, being able to point, I worked with in community mental health, I worked with youth a lot. And so one of the things we did was we love like a, a, a feelings wheel type of energy. Um, being able to do things like having just prompts for journaling or reflection, right? So even if they're not verbally sharing, having spaces if they are capable of writing, being able to write, um, being able to have space for color, just being having place to just hold space in silence, right? Um, so even if it's just sharing their name and if they want for the three times to just kind of invite people to close their eyes as they're just kind of like experiencing that story. And then at the end of the five, doing the mantra of closing and then moving on to the next person. Um, you know, one of the beauties is, is that sometimes when we are not able to verbally communicate, right? Sometimes just holding the space for a somatic release through crying or through just, you know, you know, being able to find a spot just to exist and be is, is the spiritual support. Um, and so being able to kind of provide alternative ways. I know folks who, um, when they come together, they gather together for silence, right? For like just 45 minutes of silence and that's their trauma group, right? And, you know, folks are working things out internally, they're journaling, they have the big giant um, paper on post-it boards and they might write, write words that resonate or they may be coloring or they just, they just need to have bodily presence for internal work. Um, and so that's kind of ways that I think spiritual support can kind of show up. Um, yes. Thank you, Indira. Uh, and this question comes from Nathan Bacon. I recently have found myself in a position of working with youth and young adult, and there's a lot of energy to create small groups and spiritual exploration groups. I was wondering if you have any insight on how best to incorporate these somatic resources when working with youth. Yeah, so, you know, one, hi, Nathan. Uh, um, two, I think there's a couple of ways, right? Um, so one, like I mentioned from the previous one, right? Multiple modalities for engaging internal processing work, right? So, you know, if you're working with younger people, using play as a way to cultivate this type of somatic work, whether that's, you know, having a game night and using game night as the kind of processing space, um, using things like coloring, right? Using things like that um, for, you know, older people thinking about older teens and stuff, you know, you'll be surprised how much, how equipped um, Generation Z and Generation Alpha are at emotional, being able to be emotionally competent and naming feelings and emotions, right? It's a testament to some of the values that millennial parents and Generation Z parents um, have placed on mental health and mental awareness. So often they have a, a larger toolkit than some of us adults do. <laughs> um, and so being able to kind of provide creative ways um, to cultivate creativity in working out the bodies, whether that's, you know, if if physically possible, having some type of like 
stretching, whether that's chair yoga or just intentional breath work, if that's something that is possible or just even doing, like I said, like thinking about resource spotting as a way to kind of connect with stuff. Um, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of having screen free spaces because I find that if we take away screens and force kids to connect to one another or youth to connect to one another, um, you have a more generative things for people to be able to connect to their bodies because doom scrolling is a form of like a dissociative practices if we're not careful. Um, and so, you know, thinking about what happens when we take away the veneers and kind of do things that are more tactile um, that causes us to be physically present and how that can be generative. Um, I hope that helped. Indira, not that you mentioned uh, how this, you know, newer generations come with a different toolkit that many of us adults, I, I think that's been my experience too, where I'm like, how do you know things that took me like 20 years to learn? Um, so it's, uh, I think, you know, just paying attention also to those dynamics of, you know, what, what this uh, new generations are bringing into the room. Mm -hmm. Important. And there's another question in the chat. It says, um, uh, give me one second. I think it's from uh, uh, Cyberg, um, username uh, perhaps. What kind of language would you use with a group audience where people may not have theistic belief? So divine, yeah. yes, spirit, like how, what would you suggest? Yes, what are your ways of knowing? What are, what are the things that feel affirming, good, true, pure? Um, what are the things that connect you to a larger, um, a larger view of humanity. Um, what is your, a higher, a higher laying plane of knowing or self? Um, whether that is your highest self as someone who comes from a hoodoo tradition, right? We always talk about the highest self or the expendable good or the greatest good that we connect to, even if that's just the pure, true altruistic nature of humanity. Um, divine yes spirit god those are just things that are translatable within my particular context um working with mostly black practitioners of spirituality and and stuff but if those don't resonate you know thinking about what are the terms that that makes sense so it's about learning about what connects you to things that make you feel grounded secure safe brave things that connect you to a higher sense of knowing, um, things that just feel good in your body, right? So touching to the somatic stuff. And if body and somatic stuff is kind of weird as um, normally with my non-binary and trans-specific folks, somatic birth can be, work can be kind of dicey, right? Because connecting to the body that may not align to how you show up, you know, thinking about what are the things that feel true, that feel good, using moralistic type language and connecting to those type of purposes are ways that you can use non-theistic language, but still connect to some of the practices and the things that we've engaged in, including mantras, right? There are a lot of mantras, um, you know, um, I, I, you know, I normally have a potty mouth. I've been working on doing that and things, but like, quoting rap lyrics has been a really good way, right? So for those who have been streaming Renaissance by Beyonce, which everybody should if they're a Beyonce fan, right? You know, um, you know, saying unique or quoting alien superstar, right? As mantras to be able to help me feel grounded has been a way where it's not theistic, but it still connects to certain types of practices that we have named. So hopefully that's helpful. That's wonderful. We have two more questions and I think we can get through them. Well, the first one is uh, a comment from uh, Dr. Rumble. And it says, I love how smoothly you move between tradition specific religious language and clinical language. You learn this through practice is an, an enviable skill. Yeah, I think anything that we do has to be translatable. Um, this is just one of the things, this is the value that I learned even at Duke, but also at BU, right? Is like, how do we take these very academic concepts for people who don't have, don't have the privilege to sit for, you know, sit for seven to eight years and get all of this training and get all of the student loan debt, right? How do we translate those tools, right? To um, people who don't have the privilege to just sit and read for, 
you know, years upon end. Um, and then also realizing that there's really, you know, my, as my grandma would normally say, there's nothing new under the sun, right? So the things that we have, you know, talked about, even, even through brain spotting, right, or things around affirmation work, right, they are often translatable to certain traditions of knowing, right, that we have had forever, but learning how to connect those those things so that people can see that we're not really giving a lot of tools that are novel or or not even um, new. These are things of an ancient and ancestral ways of knowing that we just have transformed language to be able to touch um, with. So learning how to be fluid has definitely been a skill that has been, been with, hey, Indira, what are you studying in school? And having to say it to people to get them to understand it. <laughs> so yeah, but anything we do should be translated. So even the ways that I'm, you know, showing up and talking about being activated or being triggered, right? Being able to connect it to a, a universal way of knowing is a way for people to be able to connect. And also it cultivates a sense of competence and confidence so that when you are sharing power in a group, people have language to access the same level and skills and tool sets that you do. And it'll empower other people to be able to take charge in those spaces as well to do the, the work. So it's not all on you. And our last question uh, is uh, again from Tafab Twa. I have groups made up of uh, one family going through grief and bereavement. I discover that they deal with grief in different ways, particularly along gender lines because of cultural expectations. Do you have a model for helping them process that grief together in a group setting? And then uh, they're adding additional information. Main reason I ask is because men tend to hide their emotions and yet in my country, they form the majority of suicide cases, um, 1300 out of 1600. Do I just accept that they can deal in group processes or is there a way to help them deal with grief in a group setting? Yeah, so there's always a way, right? And I think one of the ways we do it, right, is being creative in the ways that we organize it. So they may, you know, men within that particular context may not be open to sharing space in a traditional, like, let's sit around in a circle and share our feelings type of way, right? Um, but if there are things that are maybe physical, like, you know, going on hikes or, you know, I mean, I'm not from Zimbabwe, but my dad is Nigerian. And one of the ways that men tend to gather together, right, is through sports, right, in my family. And so I have found that there's a lot of emotional pros group processing work that's happening when watching football, right? When um, when 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 folks are getting ready to um, pound yam and eat food food and drop the bomb as we call it in our family, right? You know, in the kitchen, right, with the women who are like making jollof or making soup or making swallow, like there's there's things that are happening. So, what are some of the cultural things that men naturally do, right, together and communicate, right, in a way that you can facilitate an environment of safety? for folks to naturally bring down their guards of vulnerability, right? This is the same premise of doing, um, doing stuff like walk talk therapy or when folks go into nature and do nature focused therapy or bibliotherapy with book clubs and stuff like that. Yes. And uh, a last question from um, Elise. Do you have recommendations of books, resources that center black ritual and ancestral experience experiences that we can incorporate into the grounding moments for primarily Black and people of color groups? Yes. Ritual by Maladome Somu, uh, Some, I would roll back, grab the book and bring it here, but it'll take a little too much time, um, is one of the most transformative book about how to build a a, a culture of healing and ritual and community. Um, that is a great one. And I also just want to say hey to the Calvillo family. And yes, I have an integrated ancestral practices in affinity groups through doing stuff like ritual um, and tying into things like um, using group, things like root work and um, ancestral like memory and wisdom and building altars as a possibility. So, yeah. Wonderful. Indira, thank you so much for this uh, really, really wonderful hour you've given us of insight and, and wisdom and creativity and invitation. 
Um, it's been, you know, just really great to learn from you. And again, if you want to stay in touch with Indira, I'm posting in the chat um, the her, you know, her social media and also a link to our webinar survey. Please answer it. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. Thank you so much for being here. Indira, thank you for all that wisdom you've shared with us today. We are very grateful for your time. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure sharing this hour.